Howdy, and welcome to the Preaching Poetry Podcast. The Preaching Poetry Podcast uses poetry to inspire conversation and to rediscover the world. Let's get to it. Hey, welcome back. Today's poem is called Old Ironsides by Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr. I tear her tattered ensign down, long has it waved on high, and many an eye has danced to see that banner in the sky. Beneath it rung the battle shout and burst the cannon's roar. The meteor of the ocean air shall sweep the clouds no more. Her deck, once red with heroes' blood, where knelt the vanquished foe, when winds were hurrying o'er the flood, and waves were white below. No more shall feel the victor's tread, or know the conquered knee. The harpies of the shore shall pluck the eagle of the sea. O oh, better that her shattered hulk should sink beneath the wave. Her thunders shook the mighty deep, and there should be her grave. Nail to the mast her holy flag, set every threadbare sail, and give her to the god of storms, the lightning and the gale. Now, before we get too far into this poem, we need to talk about the name Old Ironsides. Okay, Old Ironsides is a nickname for a ship, okay, a frigate called the USS Constitution, one of the first warships ever constructed by the United States Navy, okay, built to be um, heavy, strong frigates, able to beat any uh, traditional frigate in a one-on-one -on -one kind of duel, and to be able to outrun big, powerful ships of the line. Okay, so these were not battleships. The USS Constitution was not some big, awesome, top-of-the-line, top-of-technology battleship. Not how it worked. They were building frigates because, you know, the U.S. Navy was not exactly uh, flush with cash at the beginning of its existence. And so um, U.S. Naval doctrine here was we need to have um, some ships that we can use to sort of patrol and protect our shores. Um, but at the same time, we know we can't build things to compete um, with the, the big top dogs of France and Britain, we don't have the ability to do that. So instead of focusing on building um, the ships that are going to be the best at anything in the ocean, the biggest, most powerful ships, let's instead focus on this class of ships. So a frigate is a smaller ship, um, a lot more common than the big ship-of-the-line man of wars and so the U.S. said, if we can build better frigates than anybody else, it gives us at least a little bit of an edge. And the U.S. was going to need that edge. Uh, the USS Constitution served in the quasi-war with France. I'm not going to go into details about the quasi-war. If you want to know more about it, look it up. There's a lot of interesting things going on in uh, American history during that time with the French Revolution, uh, even with the, uh, the revolution in Saint-Domingue, later Haiti. Lots of good stuff to figure out, um, but we're not going to get into that today. But we are going to talk about the war with the Barbary pirates, because the USS Constitution and other ships get sent to the Mediterranean to fight these pirates. Now, these pirates were kind of like gangsters. right? They would, um, they would sort of get you involved in this racket, and they would say, hey... That's a really nice ship you got there. Be a shame if something happened to it. And they would extort you for protection money. So if you didn't pay up, they'd be like, Oh, it's a shame. We're going to have to burn that ship down. And so the United States, when they would do trade and business around the world, they, they would pay tribute when they would have to go into the Mediterranean Sea to keep the Barbary pirates from attacking them. And one of the pirates, uh, the Pasha or Bey of Tripoli, decided that he wanted more than the original agreements. And when he asked for it, then President Thomas Jefferson basically told him that he could take that new deal and stuff it. And Thomas Jefferson ordered the U.S. Navy into the Mediterranean Sea to deal with these pirates. And so the USS Constitution was assigned to the Mediterranean to support the United States in their war against Tripoli. 
on the way there, okay, on the way to the Mediterranean, um, there was a really impressive story about uh, the USS Constitution that sort of sets the tone for the whole ship. Um, To get into the Mediterranean Sea from the Atlantic Ocean, you have to go through the Strait of Gibraltar. If you're not a geography nut, you may not know all of these terms, but essentially the Mediterranean Sea is south of Europe, north of Africa, and there's no way in or out of that sea except through the Strait of Gibraltar at this time. There's the Suez Canal today, but that did not exist then. And so the only way to get from the ocean into the sea was to go through this tiny little gap um, where North Africa sort of on the far west side of North Africa and the Iberian Peninsula where Spain is, they almost touch, they get really close, um, and that's called the Strait of Gibraltar. There's room for ships to sail in and out, but it's a narrow gap. There's not a lot of room. It's a strait. We talked about straight the gate, straight of Gibraltar. Anyway, go back and listen to our episode on Invictus if you didn't catch that reference. But... On the way through the Strait of Gibraltar, it's the middle of the night, and the captain of the USS Constitution, Edward Preble, who was also the Commodore in charge of the U.S. Navy effort, uh, the, the war they're waging in uh, against Tripoli, um, on the way in, he hails another ship. There's another ship passing by, and the USS Constitution gets close. They're not saying anything. It's it's at night. They can't see the flags. They don't know what, what kind of ship this is. And so he hails the ship, and they don't respond. Well, that's a dangerous thing, because we don't know if this is a friend or a foe. And if they're not hailing, it could be that they're about to uh, ambush you or something like that. So um, he tries one more time. They don't respond. He says, if you don't respond, I'm going to sh- I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to fire a shot, a warning shot. And the other ship responded, finally, saying, if you give us a shot, we'll give you a broadside. Now, a, a broadside is when you turn the ship sideways and you open fire with all of those guns. If you've seen those old sort of pirate ships or ships of the age of sail, you know that there may be a few guns pointed forward, there may be a few guns pointed to the back of the ship, but most of the guns are on the side, and so you would turn the ship sideways and open fire with all of those cannons at the same time. That's a broadside. And you have two ships passing each other in the strait, you know, a broadside is going to fire right into the side of your ship and probably going to do some damage. And so this ship that's threatening the USS Constitution says, if you fire a shot at us, we'll give you a broadside. We're an 84-gun British ship of the line, and you should uh, surrender to us. You know, you can come on board um, in your ship's boat. We'll accept terms from you. Come and talk to us. And Preble, the Constitution's captain, replied that, they were the United States ship constitution with 44 guns and that he would be darned. He didn't say darned, but you know, we're trying to be family friendly here. He would be darned before he surrendered. And then he yelled, blow your matches boys. That escalated quickly. Okay. And so he's about ready to, yeah, he's like, all right, let's do it. Open fire. Let's go. And Immediately, the other ship sends their boat over and says, hey, 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 look, okay, we're not actually this big ship. We're we're a British ship. We're just a 32-gun frigate. You're bigger and stronger than us. We're not trying to get into a fight with you. We just didn't see you coming. We didn't hear you coming. Your ship kind of snuck up on us, and we, we weren't sure what to do, so we were getting ready to have to fight. That's why we didn't hail you. Please, let's not do this. And so bloodshed is thankfully avoided. Um, but you can imagine that the crew of the Constitution realized very quickly, uh, this captain, what he was like and what he was going to be like in this war. And it actually earned the captain a lot of credit with his crew that he was fearless and willing to take on anything and anybody at sea. It, it actually, you know, you'd think it might make some of the crew nervous, but it, it didn't. It actually made them uh, uh, more ready to follow him. Kind of impressive. Um, and so, you know, as, as the Constitution and other United States naval ships move in to the Mediterranean, they begin to now, instead of having American ships harassed by the pirates, 
the American Navy begins to harass the pirates. And they manage to do a lot of damage to pirate ships. They start a siege um, and a blockade of Tripoli. And then, in a sort of daring nighttime attack, a handful of U.S. Marines and then like hundreds of mercenaries that they hired to supplement their army sneak across the desert... Okay, so they, they're they sneaking from um, one side to the other. I think it was over near Benghazi. And they sneak across the desert where the, the Bay of Tripoli, the Pasha there, is not expecting an attack from the desert. He's expecting an attack from the sea. And so they sneak in the back and they actually manage to capture um, a, a, one of his cities. The city of uh, Derna, I believe. And so... With all of this going on, with a blockade going on, with U.S. Marines sneaking through the desert somehow, um, not expected to be able to do that. Um, and then he, he uh, the, the Pasha of Tripoli gets this word that the U.S. has found his brother, whom he exiled, um, and they're trying to back his brother's claim to the, the Tripolitan throne now, and, and he's not happy about this, so he comes to terms. He's like, all right, all right, let's, let's talk. And so, um, the, the Pasha, sometimes called the Bey, I think I've called him both. Um, essentially that was a title for a governor or a prince in the Ottoman empire. Technically, um, Tripoli was a kingdom that was part of the Ottoman empire's confederation. Um, but essentially the governors were able to act with essential autonomy. Um, and so, um, when he's ready to surrender, he actually signs peace treaties with the U.S., realizing that he's not going to be able to to handle all of these things at once. And and so um, Preble and the USS Constitution have significant success um, in the first Barbary War. Okay, now as as good as that war went, and as well as things went for the Constitution there, that's not even what made the ship famous. Okay. After this little, you know, little tiff with the uh, the kingdom of Tripoli is over, uh, the real fun begins, and uh, the War of 1812 is going to be where the USS Constitution gains all. Like it's going to be where it gains its notoriety, where it gains most of its fame. Um, and so we're not going to talk about the War of 1812. You could do an entire, not just an episode of a podcast, but if you really wanted to, you could do a whole podcast on the War of 1812. And I, you're not here for that, and I am not, um, I'm not prepared to give you the history of the War of 1812. But we are going to talk about how the USS Constitution fared in the War of 1812. So. The USS Constitution serves with distinction in the War of 1812, and it's in the War of 1812 that it gains the nickname we talked about earlier, Old Ironsides. Okay, so um, there's there's this other ship, this British ship called the HMS Galliere. Okay, it's a French ship um, that the British capture and then basically just turn around and use against everybody else. And so the HMS Galliere uh, is a pretty infamous ship we'll just call it that one of the causes of the war of 1812 one of the big gripes that the americans had was that the british would impress um press gang their sailors and the hms guerriere was one of the ships that did that um people in the u.s did not like that ship did not like its captain and at one point the guerriere and the the squadron that she's sailing with almost capture the USS Constitution, but due to uh, a head start and some favorable winds and some luck uh, and some skill, the USS Constitution is able to escape um, and not have to fight the whole squadron at once. And then a few months later, you know, the Constitution is setting sail, it's out at sea, uh, and the weather starts to get a little bit rough, okay, and so... Um, it's cloudy, it's windy, conditions are not good to see, and, and in, in sort of this almost scripted moment, out of the clouds and the fog and the, the storms, the Guerriere and the Constitution almost bump into each other, and by the time they're, they can see each other and are close enough to do it, 
they're right up on top of each other. So they sort of, these ships are really close. They finally recognize that, oh, this is an enemy ship. And so they begin to fight. And the HMS Gary Air gets the, the first shot in and fires a massive broadside at the USS Constitution as it, appro- uh, as it approaches. And in that instance, when the HMS Gary Air gives the Constitution all she's got, the cannonballs are reported to have bounced off of the side of the USS Constitution. And it was from that encounter the Constitution gained her nickname. And then through some very... I'm not saying that you know it was a done deal. Um, there was a lot of skillful work done, and the, the Constitution... Like, they handed the Guerrier a, a, a crippling defeat. They they even broke the main mast of the ship. Um, and when the mast like that is broken, there was nothing left. Like, the Guerrier was going to sink. There was no salvaging it. Not, not going to work. Um, and the captain's like, all right, you know, British captain, do you, uh, you going to strike your colors? He's like, you struck them for us. We had them up on the top of our mast, and you blew that thing off. Okay, so it was an overwhelming victory. And I don't want to take any uh, skill away from the crew, any heroism away, heroism away from the Constitution and her crew. But remember, the USS Constitution and other United States Navy frigates were built for that sort of thing. They were built to be able to beat any other ship in a one-on-one duel except one of them big 84-gun ship of the lines. And it worked spectacularly. So this U.S. naval doctrine of we're going to have ships, uh, frigates that are more heavily armored and more heavily armed than regular frigates worked out spectacularly. Okay, And so American frigates um, had never really gone up against the the British or the French uh, frigates in sort of a, in a fair one-on-one kind of fight, you know, a fair fight, even though, you know, the Constitution was definitely the more powerful ship. Uh, but in a fair fight, like one-on-one, this justified U.S. naval doctrine there and, and made it look like, yeah, this was worthwhile. This was a good decision. Good job. Uh, I think it was John Adams who was president when that was set out, but I I know that I think it was a secretary of the Navy who decided those things. And anyway, so the USS constitution being that sort of awesome put together built for this sort of thing, ship managed to also go on to defeat, um, three more British ships, one in sort of single combat, the HMS Java, but also the Cyan and the Levant, um, who were, you know, kind of fighting together. He, the, the Constitution kind of picked off one of them and then got the other one. And so Old Ironsides was never defeated in in her service, in the in, in active service in the United States Navy. And to this day, you know, never defeated. She never lost a battle. Okay? And so uh, it, it was sort of stunning success for this ship. But... You know, as the War of 1812 wraps up, and as you get further and further along, you know, this ship was built um, in the, you know, 1700s. We're talking, you know, in the sort of, I think it was the uh, the last decade of the 1700s, 1790-something. Because um, it would have been, yeah, it would have been the uh, 1790s when it was built. I think it was 1794. Could be wrong. Some of y'all will probably know, and you'll probably correct me um, in the comment section somewhere, and that's fine. Please do. Um, anyway, in 1830, a rumor starts to go around that the USS Constitution is going to be scrapped, meaning they're going to take the ship apart, they're going to pull the cannons off, pull the sails off, ropes, all that stuff, see what they can use um, to, to sort of retrofit and fix other ships, and then basically they'll sell the rest for parts. And it was that rumor that inspired our author to write this poem. Okay, And so the thought of scrapping this historic storied ship um, 
made Oliver Wendell Holmes feel like he had to say something. So he writes his poem. Okay, the poem that we've read already. I'm not going to read it again. Um, but let's go back to the poem and let's look at the first stanza. Okay. I tear her tattered ensign down, long has it waved on high, and many an eye has danced to see that banner in the sky. So, the word ensign indicates naval rank today, like a junior rank for a commissioned officer. Um, but, but really, like the ensign in the old days was like a color guard. Okay, um, They were responsible for the ship's colors and the ship's flag. So, you would raise a flag on your ship on the main mast, the tallest mast, um, and they called that the colors because, you know, sails are white. They're not, you know, colorful. You don't spend your money trying to print colorful sails, typically. Instead, you know, the, the colors are your nation's flag, and that's the highest flag on the ship. So the ship sails under the colors. That's where that phrase comes from. We sail under the colors of the United States on this ship. <clears throat> So to say that we're tearing down the ensign is to take down the U.S. flag flying at the top of the mast. Okay, And so that flag could inspire great hope if you are coming up across another ship in the age of sail and they have the same flag or a friendly flag. That's good news. We, we don't have to fight today. Um, but if you came up against an enemy flag under enemy colors, you'd have to get ready to fight. You'd have to, you know, start manning the cannons and getting ready, every, all hands on deck, battle stations kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, the, the ensign is really, really important. And so I, I like the image here. I'm, I'm not a sailor. I'm not a nautical person. Um, but he says, <clears throat> um, you know, beneath it rung the battle shout and burst the cannon's roar and the meteor of the ocean air shall sweep the clouds no more. Um, th that word sweep, I, I kind of had to look this up, but the word sweep, I've heard that word associated with like ships and sailing. I didn't know what it meant, but actually a sweep is an oar. And so he says, you know, the meteor of the ocean air shall sweep the clouds. And so instead of sweeping the water, right, rowing through the water, he paints this picture of, you know, the meteor of the ocean era. I guess it's either the, the ship or the flag, but one of those things is sweeping the clouds. So it's a sweep, kind of like an oar in the clouds. I, I could be wrong. Maybe I'm off. If you if you know what he's talking about with that sweep, I think it's a pun. I think there's some, like, double entendre there. But if I'm wrong, let me know what you think. Okay. Again, comment sections, great things. Um, or you can send us an email. You know, that'll work too. Th this poem in these stanzas calls to mind the battles that the Constitution has fought and won. Um, defending America's honor, right? This, this fledgling nation against Imperial Britain at, you know, maybe not quite the height of its power, but definitely at a time when it was far more powerful than the United States. Um, and America manages to hold its own. So it calls that to mind. So we, we're sort of getting that nostalgia. And we're getting ready to say goodbye to the ship because it's about to be scrapped. In the second stanza, he goes on to say, Her deck, once red with heroes' blood, where knelt the vanquished foe, when wins wins. Wins? Okay, the second stanza. Her deck once red with hero's blood where knelt the vanquished foe when winds were hurrying o'er the flood and waves were white below Ooh, it's hard to say that say that five times fast when winds when winds when winds you're gonna miss that d on the end people are gonna say think you're saying when winds Ugh. anyway Again, we're calling to mind the glorious past of the ship and the crew and the enemies they defeated and the many stormy seas that old Ironside sailed through. But just like the British ships and her foes couldn't sink her, neither could the sea, right? No, no more shall feel the victor's tread or know the conquered knee. The harpies of the shore shall pluck the eagle of the sea. Okay, so the ship is not destined to win any more battles, not destined to prevail in any more glorious fights for the survival of the fledgling republic. And that eagle is that profoundly American symbol, right? The eagle of the sea. 
and then he calls to to mind, you know, mentioning these harpies. Now, harpies are um, Greek mythology. They're they're monsters from Greek mythology. Um, they're half you know human woman and half bird, and they are the personification and representation of storms. Of right, stormy winds, you know, threats to the sailors, threats to the ships. Um, but they're the harpies of the shore. I think he does that on purpose. He's, you know, calling the harpies, even though harpies are associated with storm winds at sea, he says they're the harpies of the shore. Because while the sea could never sink or take this ship down, now the harpies of the shore want to scrap her. They want to take old Ironsides apart. You know, how ironic is it? Is it that the eagle of the sea would fall to the harpies of the shore? You know, you'd think it would have been more fitting if the eagle of the sea had fallen to at least the real harpies. Like, if, if the ship had sunk into the ocean, or even, you know, had to be scuttled because it was damaged in battle or something, it seems like that would even be a better end than this sort of, you know, taking her apart for scrap. And then comes the third stanza. And this is where Oliver Wendell Holmes wants to introduce us to a new idea. He says, you know what? Instead of scrapping the ship, let's do this. He says, oh, better that her shattered hulk should sink beneath the wave. Her thunders shook the mighty deep, and there should be her grave. Nail to the mast her holy flag, set every threadbare sail, and give her to the god of storms the lightning, and the gale. So he says, I have a new proposal. Instead of scrapping this ship, we should sink the ship. Right? We should sail it out into the ocean and let the ocean have her. Let the sea take her down. He says, this would be a much more fitting end. Let's bury the ship at sea rather than scrap it. You know, her thunders, her cannons shook the depth. She sent many of her enemies to a watery grave. It seems only fitting that she should go to one as well, rather than let the shore harpies have their way. So he says this, you know, nail to the mast her holy flag. Well, that tattered ensign from the beginning, the colors, the flag, he says, we're tearing it down. We're scrapping the ship, but you know what? No, no, let's do this instead. Let's nail it to the mast. So the where that phrase comes from is this. When you're sailing a ship, the colors tell you who you're fighting for. But if you're a warship, if you take down your colors, what that means is it's a signal that you intend to surrender. Right? It says, we're done fighting. We give up. It was the way that you connotated that your country was not going to fight anymore. The flag leaves the battlefield or the battle sea, so to speak. And so there were captains and there are famous stories of sort of this Alamo mentality, right? You know, um, victory or death. And we're going to nail the flag to the mast. Because if you nail the flag to the top of the mast, you can't pull it down. You can't just take it down with the rope and pulley. You can never surrender. So we nail it to the mast. And so when someone talks about nailing your flag to the mast, it's one of those give me liberty or give me death sort of moments. Give me victory or death. I am going to either succeed or I'm going to die, but I am not going to quit. I am not going to surrender. And so when he says we're going to nail this flag to the mast, he says this ship should fight to her death, not be scrapped by the shore harpies, not be scrapped for parts for other ships. So we're going to nail the flag to the mast, sail her out, and she's going to sail to her death, uh, albeit a bitter, salty, watery death given to the God of storms, the lightning and the gale. Does that make you sad? The thought of this ship being scrapped is sad. And I guess the thought of the ship sinking is better, but it's still really sad, isn't it? 
But you see, Oliver Wendell Holmes had no intention of actually trying to get this ship sunk. That was not what he was doing. It's a false flag. The red herring. He doesn't actually want to sink the ship. By presenting that as the alternative, he's trying to galvanize public opinion to save the ship. And it works. It works with a stunning amount of success. So he writes this poem to honor the ship in light of its eminent decommissioning. But this poem does far more than that. It, it motivates the public to try to save it. You see, people read this poem in, in a newspaper and, and they're moved to tears at the thought that this symbol of, of America's pride and strength, this symbol of our ability to hold our own and stand our own ground is going to be scrapped. And they're not happy with the idea of just sinking it. They want to save it. And so there's like this, this sort of grassroots letter writing campaign. And, you know, this, the, the Secretary of the Navy decides, yeah, we're not going to scrap the ship. Now, there are some people who say there were never any plans to actually scrap the ship, that it was a rumor that got started. But regardless, because of this poem and because of the sentiment behind it, the USS Constitution is still around to this day. Yeah, get that. And in fact, the USS Constitution is the oldest still commissioned ship in the world that still floats. Okay, there's one commissioned ship by the British Royal Navy, but it's in dry dock. It doesn't actually go out and sail in the sea. And yet the USS Constitution does. You see, it still belongs to the U.S. Navy, and the U.S. Navy still runs it. There are rotations through where they will assign a captain from the U.S. Navy to this ship because it's still considered to be a warship, even though it's more of a museum piece and sort of a special thing now. Um, but, but the ship still exists, and the majesty and beauty and power of this poem inspired people to do that. You see, with this poem, with the words that he chooses and the, the powerful onomatopoeias, right? The, the words that sound like something else. I know I, I kind of struggle with that um, concept in previous episodes. Go back and listen if you haven't. But, you know, those words that sound like what they're describing, like shatter. Her shattered hulk should sink beneath the waves. Her thunder shook the mighty deep, right? So you have those sorts of this, this beautiful poem. It's beautiful to read. It's fun to listen to. And it's a lot of fun to read out loud. I can tell you that much. But the power of this poem was that it, it has saved this ship, the USS Constitution, even to this day. Even to this day. And so Holmes teaches us something interesting here. He teaches us that, you know, you don't have to be direct when you're communicating with people. Sometimes, if you're smart and crafty and a good poet, you can actually use indirect communication. You can say one thing like, sinker, let her go, give her to the god of storms, when you actually want her to be saved. Because by presenting this option to people, you know they're going to reject it. And they're going to naturally go to the other side and say, no, we need to save the ship. You see, Holmes does something impressive there, and I would love to be that sort of next level communicator. You know what I mean? I, I just I'm inspired by Holmes here and his sort of ability to make that work. And while this poem is inspiring and it it helps us to admire and remember uh, a time in American history, it's also an example to me of what you can do you can inspire and motivate people with the words that you use. And it's not always about being direct. There are a lot of ways to move and shake the world around you. And sometimes you can, you can really do a lot more good than you would have directly with exaggeration, with overspeaking, with overstating your case. Like, well, let's just sink her and move people to what you actually want. You know, I think we can learn from that. I think we can be like that. Um, another thing is that I, I can, I, I'm, I'm inspired by 
Oliver Wendell Holmes' ability to inspire other people to a righteous cause. But I also appreciate this view of we want to protect and preserve this part of our national mythology. Right? So, you know, for most of us, we would say that it is important to preserve our history. And this ship is certainly a historic one. Old Ironsides still being around today is a pretty useful tool for people to learn about not just the ship itself, but the age of sail. Because it's a still functioning ship and it will still go out on sailing runs and do demonstrations. And so it's still it's an interesting way to stay connected to our past and to preserve our knowledge. But it's not just about preserving the historical knowledge of the ship itself and the details of the ship. But what that ship represents to our national consciousness, I think, is worth preserving. Not every artifact from history is worth hanging on to. Okay? But the USS Constitution represents a part of our national mythology that is worth hanging on to. When we look at what she represented, the ability to stand up to a bigger, more powerful enemy, to hold our own, to protect ourselves, the USS Constitution was an inspiration to the United States during the War of 1812. Because you see, (laughs) it's kind of hard to look at that, at what happened, and say that the U.S. won If anything, we signed a treaty to end it, but I wouldn't say that we won the war. I mean, in the War of 1812, Washington, D.C. was burned to the ground. The Capitol was burned. That's not a good thing. (laughs) That is a horrible blow to American morale. But this ship represented hope to the United States. It showed that new country what it wanted to be, the best reflection of itself. That sort of ingenuity to say, we're going to pick a a strategy that's a little bit different and we're going to make it work for ourselves. We're going to be resourceful and build ships that can win in these situations because we know we can't compete at the big level, so we're not going to try there. We're going to put our ingenuity and effort into finding a way to give ourselves an edge. And that sort of resourcefulness, that American new world way of looking at things, that was something that the country needed to preserve. We needed to know that we could stand up to these old world countries, that we could protect ourselves and to be able to hold your own against the British Navy, even while the British army is burning down your capital is a huge thing. And so that part of our national mythology that says when, it, when, when the chips are down and when everything seems to be hopeless, we can still stick up for ourselves and we can still fight for our rights and our freedoms and we can win. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I think that's a mythology, that's a history, that's a narrative about our country worth preserving. Now... You may disagree. You may look at this and say, a ship is a ship, no big deal. I I don't know what you actually think about this poem and about old Ironsides. I don't know if it moved you or inspired you. But I do think that if you ever get the chance to go to Boston, buy me a plane ticket, I'll go with you, and we'll go and we will look at the ship. We'll go to it. Hopefully it'll be open. Uh, I don't think it's open right now with COVID and, and all of that going on. But, you know, hopefully one day I'll go to Boston or we'll go to Boston and we'll be able to actually go and, and see this ship, to see old Ironsides. Maybe together we could read the poem and maybe together we could reflect. And while you may not see everything that I did, I hope that this has been, if nothing else, inspiring to you. What do you think? And bloopers. You see, he presents that idea of sinking the ship, of sailing her out and scuttling her as a red heron. Er, Red heron. What is that? 
when wins 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 sorry thank you for listening to the preaching poetry podcast i hope that you've enjoyed your time with us and we look forward to having you back for more if you like what you heard please be sure to leave a review and don't forget to subscribe If you're looking for more content, you can find us on Apple, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, basically anywhere you find podcasts. If you want to join our community or just want to get in touch with us, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Preaching Poetry.